Hello, everyone who is joining us right now and welcome. We're going to give a few minutes for folks to get logged in and settled and then we will go ahead and get started. So uh, sit tight for just a minute. And we'll be right with you. Okay, for those who are just joining us, uh, just to let you know, we're giving it just a couple minutes until everyone trickles in um, and we'll get started in, in a moment. Alrighty, welcome. Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Catherine Shortliff and I am the engagement manager at Fruitlands Museum, which is a property of the trustees. Thank you all so much for coming this evening and um, we are thrilled to have you here for a wonderful evening as we dive into some thoughts and dreams of utopia with Paige Johnston, Alex Arts, and Tim Devon. I want to first acknowledge that Fruitlands Museum is located on the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Nipmuc and Pawtucket tribal nations, closely related to the nearby Massachusetts and Wampanoag tribal nations. We acknowledge the history of settler colonialism and repeated violations of sovereignty and territory perpetuated by European settlers. I am not currently on site at Fruitlands and I personally join you today from Pawtucket and Massachusetts land. Since 2016, Fruitlands Museum has been part of the trustees, Massachusetts oldest and largest land conservation and preservation organization with 120 properties across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We are a member supported institution and if you enjoy your experience here today, we encourage you to check out more events and opportunities both at Fruitlands and at all of our other special places across the state. I also wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone who donated in support of today's program. We appreciate your support. And now the main event. I would like to introduce Paige Johnston, co-curator of the contemporary exhibition within Recruiting for Utopia, Print and the Imagination, now on view in the Wayside Gallery at Fruitlands through March 21st, with open hours on Saturdays and Sundays through advanced ticketing. Paige K. Johnston is a culture worker and mother based in Harvard, Massachusetts. Currently, she works as the Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and makes art in collaboration with her partner under the name Life After Life. Formerly, Paige was the manager of special collections for the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome, Paige. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks everyone who's tuning in tonight. Um, as Catherine just said, my name is Paige Johnston and I'm the co-curator for the contemporary part of Recruiting for Utopia, Print and the Imagination. 
My co-curator, Shana Gar, unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight. But two of the incredible artists from the show are with us, and I will introduce you to them in just a couple of minutes. First, I want to kind of place you within the exhibition. Probably many of you haven't had a chance to see it. Um, and I want to give you kind of an overview of what's there um, and some context for our conversation tonight. So about a year and a half ago, Shane Agar and I got into a conversation about the strategies that 19th century folks used to find and create community. At the time of our conversation, Shana was um, in the early stages of developing an exhibition featuring illustrated banners that the Millerites used in the latter half of the 1800s to recruit new members. That material is uh, what goes on to populate the historic half of the exhibition Recruiting for Utopia. So the Millerites were a religious group who believed that they had uh, been able to determine the exact date of the end of the world uh, using information that they'd gleaned from biblical texts. And so these illustrated banners that they created, as well as broadsides and other printed materials, those were things that they used to actively get the word out um, that if people in the public had any hope of being saved, they needed to join. So, you know, it's certainly possible to dispute the idea that joining a community in advance of the apocalypse is utopian, but using that as a starting point, um, it opened up a lot of fascinating conversations between us about these overlapping histories, the overlapping histories of utopian projects and experimentation and print culture. And, and also the ways that those histories continued to intertwine throughout the 20th century all the way up to now. So for the exhibition, Recruiting for Utopia, as I mentioned, we divided it into two parts. One part contains objects from the 19th century, Millerite banners, but also some other materials. And one part contains contemporary works. The contemporary works are the focus of tonight's program. And they take a range of different printed forms, including manifestos, instruction manuals, divination decks, comic books, zines, and beyond that. And in the pursuit of particular types of communities, these works broadcast uh, a number of kind of related messages, um, themes connected to alternative governance, new gender relations, self-reliance, settler colonial resistance, uh, harmony with nature, and self-education. And the majority of the works that we included in the show have been produced as multiples, meaning they're not one of a kind unique artworks like uh, a painting might be. And they're meant to be distributed and handled um, by the person who's interacting with the artwork. So across all the different works, the artists in the show, you know, they embrace, they interrogate, and they play around with or poke fun at the idea that we can build new communities um, and maybe even new worlds. So the work that they have done, the work that's included in the show, you know, it really shows us that the project of utopia, um, even though it may be flawed, by definition, it's still something that is worth recruiting for. And now without further ado, let me introduce you to tonight's participants. Each of them will give a short presentation about their work. And then the three of us will come together for a conversation. Um, we encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will incorporate those questions into the discussion later on. So first we have Tim Devin. Tim is an artist, a librarian, and a proud self-publisher. He is fascinated by how communities work and by all things DIY. His projects have been covered by NPR, 
Canadian Public Radio, Wired, and the Boston Globe. And his self-published books have been collected by the Museum of Modern Art, the Tate Museum, and Harvard University, among others. Alex Arzt, who is our other participant tonight, is an interdisciplinary artist, a researcher, and a gardener based in Oakland, California. She is currently an affiliate artist at the Headland Center for the Arts in Marin County, California, and a lecturer in art practice at UC Berkeley. Her publishing projects are in the collections of libraries at Stanford, the Getty Research Institute, and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So now I will turn it over to Tim to talk about his work. All right, great. Well, thanks for having me. Um, really exciting to be part of this event and this show. Um, and I get to talk about some of my favorite stuff. So thanks so much uh, to Shana and to Paige and to Catherine. Okay, we're up. Um, so thanks so much for having me and uh, for being here, y'all. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mapping Out Utopia, which is um, my series. Uh, it looks at countercultural organizations and spaces in the Boston area in the 1970s. Uh, and they're based on uh, information that I found in old countercultural directories and books and magazines, things like that. Um, so Boston, for those that don't know it, Boston was one of the major countercultural um, cities at the time with hundreds and hundreds of organizations. Um, so I've mapped out the ones I could find the addresses for, and this is what I got, right? So there was a lot going on at the time. Um, the reason I did this was, I think that the 70s gets a bad rap. Uh, I think that a lot of the ideas happened in the 60s, but they were implemented in the 70s in a successful way that worked at the time and also changed society down to today. And so I wanted to explore this. Um, so that's where that all came from. Um, so Mapping Out Utopia uh, presents all the information that I found about these organizations, where they were located, the years they were active, uh, what the spaces are used for now. Uh, and it took two forms. One was um, the books, and the other were walking tours, uh, which often involved members of the original organization. So in this, in this picture, the guy with the umbrella, Nick Torkelson, is talking about a uh, radical collective print shop that he worked at uh, that published, among other things, Our Bodies, Ourselves, uh, here in Somerville. And I think that uh, what I liked about the walking tour component was uh, it was, I think, an interesting way of experiencing history, you know, wandering around the neighborhood. But also the spaces in between the spots, I think, are kind of interesting as ways for people to mingle and share ideas. And you know, oftentimes there are the um, contemporary uh, people involved in contemporary organizations who could pick the brains of the folks uh, from the older generation. I thought that that was cool. Um, so I thought I'd just say a few examples of what I found and also some things that may be inspiring uh, in, you know, 2021. Um, so there were a lot of um, grassroots environmentalist groups uh, like um, Ecology Action, which among other things, um, ran a free bus service in Cambridge. Um, there were alternative schools that gave kids a say in their own education, including the ability to fire their teachers, which I think is pretty interesting. I also thought it was interesting the way the groups um, helped each other out. So they would share spaces, they would share leases, maybe neither group could afford uh, a lease, but together they could, right? So they would help each other out. Um, I think a lot of the organizations that I found are pretty relevant now. Uh, I think that they show uh, a caring network that uh, helped to, sought to help people uh, beyond what the government was doing. Gee, does that sound familiar, uh, that need? And at the same time, they were trying to change the way people interacted with each other on a daily basis in, a, I think, a really interesting way. So uh, one example I think that really fits the bill here is um, hotlines. So people would just open up a phone line and let anybody call and they would try to help them out as best as they could. And some of them even had um, spare rooms that they would let strangers stay in if somebody needed a place to stay. Um, so hotlines were a really big thing at the time, a support network for people. Um, another thing was the women's health movement. So at the time uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was a feeling that uh, the mainstream, you know, the, the health system really wasn't doing it for women, right? Uh, and so a lot of 
women uh, would band together and start their own um, space and offer their own services in a non-hierarchical way, uh, staffed only by women. And out of that came a lot of um, DIY stuff, uh, including Our Bodies Ourselves, which was published here in Somerville. Um, same with the uh, gay health movement in the 70s and 80s. You no, know, it was from a perceived need uh, that health was not being addressed properly. And that seems pretty important these days too, right? Um, the last example I wanted to give was private food cooperatives. Um, so uh, healthy food wasn't really readily available in the 70s. So most of it was prepackaged and processed. And you didn't really have many farmers markets in cities. They didn't have organic food. And so what a lot of people did was they would pool their, their money, establish a relationship with a local farm, and then go buy the food, bring it back, distribute it, and maybe you know, share it up for free to some people. Some people would uh, pay more, uh, but in a, a really uh, a nice kind of mutual aid way, um, which seems, I think, pretty, pretty pertinent right now. Um, so I thought those were some nice examples. Uh, so networks and communities, um, you know, as Paige said, are important to me. Um, I've been involved in a number of community groups. I've done a number of uh, community art projects over the years and creative projects that have addressed these kinds of topics. Uh, so I thought I'd just uh, mention a few of those. So one was People's Tours, um, which, and that's me right in the middle there with the sign. Um, we were a uh, kind of a, a largish group, maybe about six to 10 people. Uh, we came out of Occupy Boston, which was, for those that don't know it, uh, back in 2011 was this sort of movement um, across America and Europe. Uh, and we came out of that and uh, People's Tours um, looked at sites of people's struggles and campaigns and strikes uh, in the Boston area and we gave walking tours and the idea was to find inspiration and find what worked in the past, right? And uh, Heather McCann is the one with the sunglasses on the left. Uh, Neil Korski is an artist, the guy in the blue baseball hat. And Dave Tabor is the guy with the horn. Uh, and like I said, there were a few others of us. Um, another related project that I thought I'd mention really quick is the Somerville Stock Exchange, which was a community art project that tried to provide a platform for people to share what they were doing in their private lives. Um, either through volunteering or just one-to-one -one peer stuff uh, to make Somerville a better place. And the idea there was to broadcast these things that are often kind of secretive and hidden. And maybe other people would um, find inspiration. Um, everybody um, got quote unquote Somerville stock, which rose and fell in value. And there was a whole money thing going on. Uh, it was also a fundraiser for nonprofits, including the Somerville Homeless Coalition. Uh, and the last one that I thought might be a little relevant here is uh, this zine that I did uh, in 2016 that looked at parenting advice that I found in um, countercultural publications in the 70s. I also compared them to what grown up hippie kids said about their childhood. So sort of fact checking it. Um, so I thought that might be a little relevant here. Sorry, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. Um, so I thought I would just mention really quick a few of the publications that I relied on and I just think are fantastic. Um, so one is Communities Magazine, which started in the early 70s as, uh, as uh, like a journal for the back to the land hippie commune movement. And in the mid 70s, it embraced the urban sharing cooperative movement. And it's still around today. It's really a, it's a wonderful publication. Um, I was lucky enough to like get a whole fat stack of these at one point. And I love them as much for the content, which is amazing, as the graphic design. Um, and here's like this really fun detail of an illustration of an article uh, for a rural commune. Uh, it's totally irrelevant, but it's, it's, really, it's really magical. Uh, New Women's Survival Catalog was another one that I relied on for mapping out Utopia. And uh, they have a really amazing mission statement. So I'm just gonna read that. Um, this book catalogs and documents activities which unlike women's businesses and enterprises that have existed all along are aimed explicitly at the development of an alternative women's culture. Um, so this book actually, uh, somebody reprinted this recently and if you're interested, you can track it down. Um, but this book was put together by a group of feminists who, um, wanted to provide a guidebook 
and a list of existing organizations so people could contact them or seek inspiration. And it, they also had a number of essays. So here's the daycare resources section at a time when daycare was actually um, an innovative thing. Um, another one I just wanted to mention real quick, uh, actually two publications from a local group, uh, a Quaker offshoot called Vocations for Social Change. Uh, this one was called No Bosses Here, and it was, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, this was a source book for uh, cooperative organizations. So things that were collectively run, where everybody was the owner, everybody shared the profits, everybody rotated jobs. And this was a pretty common thing in the counterculture at the time in the 70s. And this was the guidebook for it, and it was published here in Cambridge. And that was at the time when um, collectively run things were seen as the path forward for radically transforming um, capitalism from within, right? Like if you could take the, the sort of competitive teeth out of capitalism, maybe things would be a little bit better. And I just wanted to end by quickly mentioning People's Yellow Pages, um, which started in Cambridge as a annual directory of um, of countercultural organizations. And it, it, was, it was such a great format that people from around the country and around Canada copied it. And so there are people's yellow pages all around the world. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I will pass it on to Alex. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Uh, let me share my screen with you all. Okay, yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks to the Fruitlands Museum and Shana Page and Catherine for hosting. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, so the project I'm going to talk about um, is the book series that's included in Recruiting for Utopia, uh, the Positions and Situations Project, um, which is the three volumes of books you see here. Uh, the project is a series of 100 letter correspondences between myself and people who place classified ads in 70s magazines, published as resources for Back to the Landers, such as Mother Earth News um, and other magazines. So just for some context, the Back to the Land movement of the 70s was one of the largest urban to rural migrations in the US and was born out of the tumultuous 60s counterculture in Vietnam War era. And during this time, there were the civil rights, <clears throat> gay rights, and women's liberation movement movements going on. So it was a destabilizing time, and it was also a time of much idealism and utopian thinking. Uh, so disillusioned young people began experimenting with urban and rural communes and homestead at the, homesteads at the time. Um, and an estimated 1 million mostly white, educated, and middle-class young Americans went back to the land in the late 60s and early 70s. And um, this time period, as we saw in Tim's presentation, was a, was a boon for alternative and underground publishing. Um, for this project in particular, I drew from the classified sections in the Mother Earth News, Country Women, Alternatives Newsletter, and the Modern Utopian. Um, and this is more of my source material set up in context for a, a book release in Oakland a couple years ago. So before the internet, uh, the classifieds created a network of outreach to like-minded others. Um, this slide is an example of how extensive the positions and situations section of the Mother Earth News was in the mid 70s. Uh, sometimes there were upwards of 300 ads per issue with people seeking everything from private utopian islands to organic farming experience. And the ads were, quote, designed to help would be back to the landers get in touch with folks already out there and were required to have a country slant. So in 2014, as an experiment in grad school, I started writing letters responding to some of the ads. And this was one of the first I wrote to. Um, I'm just going to read it. Love is the answer. Would like to work my way around the country and meet people who are tired of playing society's games and are living life the way it's meant to be lived. 
My name is Dave, 20, and I'm an, an ambitious, sincere person seeking adventure, skills, and most of all, the opportunity to know real people of all races, ages, and beliefs. I'm interested in everything positive in life. In exchange for room board and teaching me whatever your skill happens to be, I will work hard and be one of the best friends you've ever had. Dave Lambert. Um, so I was surprised to get a response to my letter. Um, that was like kind of devastating and realized that this would turn into a much larger project. So I started methodically writing letters um, when I finished school in 2015. Um, and this is one of two folios of correspondences. So I wrote a letter to every ad in the magazine from 1970 to 1976 um, that I could find an address for online. And this was made easier because full names, ages, and addresses were usually listed and I used that information to find current addresses. Um, but there are clear limits to this methodology. So people who felt safe reaching out in this way and exposing their information were generally people who fit into the dominant culture, um, while those who did not relayed their letters through the magazine or listed a PO box. Um, so as a result, there are voices missing from this project and it is in no way a, a complete survey. Um, so my initial letter asked two questions. Uh, what came in the ad? And did you find what you were looking for the year the ad was placed? And of the 800 letters I sent, I received about 200 responses. And the books themselves are comprised of 100 of the response letters that granted me permission to publish. Um, and to print, to print the books, I used a risograph machine. Um, and I chose that because its patents originate from the mimeograph and gestetner, which were two printing processes once used to print alternative publications. Um, and the risograph, it looks like a copy machine and prints one color of ink at a time uh, using a screen made from a digital image. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about each of the books. Um, the three books are organized chronologically, and the first volume covers 1968 to 1973. Uh, it's a look into the beginning of the movement as seen through these publications. And so each book is formatted chronologically also by the date of the ad, and then it's paired with the corresponding letter or response. The project also includes interviews with 10 letter writers that I visited across the country. Um, this is an interview with a couple who joined a women's land project in Mendocino, and they've stayed in the original farm, farmhouse since then. Um, so volume two was sort of the in-between book. By 1974, the Mother Earth News ads became many pages long, like I showed you for every issue. Um, and so Back to the Land at that time was sort of going mainstream by the mid 70s. Um, and not only that, but the ads were a financial boon for the magazine. So they cost like in today's money about $60 per ad to, to post. Um, another publication I drew from was Country Women, which was a rural feminist magazine. Um, that was part of a collective started at that women's land project I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and the classifieds were usually only a page long in the back of each issue. Uh, and so the third book, which is the last one, um, was printed in 2019. And it's really the conclusion to the project. It's much longer, it's 300 pages, three, 35 letters and four interviews. And the book I wanted to mention includes a forward by Kate DeLaws, who's the author of We Are As Gods. Um, and I asked her to write for it because her book is a really clear eyed, um, critical history of the Back to the Land movement. Her parents moved to rural Vermont in the 70s. So she has personal experience in the movement, um, but has a new generation's perspective as well. Um, so in addition to the letters I received from the ads 40 years later, another element of the project is collecting and archiving the original letters received in the 70s. Um, so for example, here, the Madhava Honey Farm in Colorado placed an ad in 1975 looking for, quote, spiritually and politically conscious people interested in working towards self-sufficient agricultural harmony. 
and the man who placed the ad still runs the honey company and he saved these responses um, from the 70s and shared them with me for the book. Um, and so they're outlined in the book and printed on, on this yellow paper. Uh, so just to, to wrap up and conclude, the stories in the project really range from happy to very dark. There are stories of falling in love, getting divorced, getting involved in cults and finding a way out. Um, having hand-built houses burned down, which you see here, hitchhiking, adventure, boredom, frustration, and finding peace. Um, so it's like a, a full range of stories, as you might expect from such like a large sample of people. Uh, so the project concludes in 1976 also because that was the year the positions and situations ads were discontinued in their original form. And the reason for this is not entirely clear, but I think it has much to do with the murder of a family by a couple who answered their ad. Um, and it is disturbingly referenced by several of the letter writers in volume three. So I think that was a major factor um, of them discontinuing it. And by 1976, the original fervor and idealism of the Back to the Land movement was starting to wane as well. Um, so as a result of printing the books for this project, I started my own small press called A Magic Mountain. I print artist book zines and most recently uh, have published a collaborative field guide with Salmon Creek Farm in Mendocino, um, which was also a former commune and I've been involved with, with the place as a result of researching this project. Thank you. I think I hand it over to Paige. Yeah, and we'll just give Tim a chance to turn himself back on too. Hi. So thank you both. I always feel um, a little bit bad about asking an artist to talk about their work in such a compressed amount of time. So thank you for trying to, um, you know, give us a glimpse into to what are obviously much larger and more involved practices. You know, there, there are a lot of things that I want to get into about these works, but um, I want to step back first and ask you a more material question, the same question to both of you, which is um, why books or Tim, in your case, why zines? Um, what is it, you know, because the material that you are researching could have lent itself to any number of material outputs, any number of different media. So I was wondering if you could start by just talking to us a little bit about how you decided on this media form for the output. Tim, you wanna go first? Sure, sure. For this particular one, um, well, I've been publishing, um, self-publishing for a while, so it kind of made sense. Um, I chose, to sort of emulate the style, um, the graphic style of a lot of um, books that I was looking at. And um, that's why they came out like that. And I thought that the, you know, the texture of the, I have one here, the texture kind of reminded me of some of the stuff that I was looking at. So in some ways I tried to emulate that. Uh, in terms of books in general, I, I just think that they stick around a lot longer. Like just think about all the, the tabs and all the links that of stuff you meant to read and now it's gone forever, you know? I think that um, it's still pretty relevant in you know, 2021. Um, were you also asking about why I make books in general or just for this one project? I, well, I was thinking for this one project but I would like to hear from both of you about um, how books factor into your larger practice. So if you wanna talk about that now, that's great. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just, uh, for, I've always made zines, um, but when I was making a lot more community art projects, I liked them as a takeaway. Um, so something that people could have for participating or something like a keepsake. Um, I like, I like making things. I used to work in publishing and uh, seeing uh, the amount of people involved in publishing and the length of time between idea and creation um, is kind of a big turnoff for me. 
Um, it's also what also ends up happening with a lot of like um, larger publications is that the end product kind of bears very little relation to the author's initial ideas. And so by being in charge of all of those things, I get to do that on myself. Um, I also think it's kind of an equity thing. There's a lot of like grudge work that goes along with creating a publication. And why should somebody else have to do that for me? I'm the one who thought of it. Um, I don't know. And what about um, as a librarian? You know, you're someone who's interacting with printed material all the time. Um, maybe my question can go in a little bit of a chicken and an egg direction with like, which came first, you know, the zine maker or the librarian, um, you know, was it, is the librarian practice being fed by the zine maker practice or the is the librarian, the zine maker practice, you know, how are they interacting with each other? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I became a librarian because I love books so much, for sure. Um, but yeah, um, I think that, yeah. Hey, I also run the small press and zine collection at our library. So I've been able to take that and create that, which I think is really valuable and people seem to really like it. Um, I think that people really respond to zines, so the handmade quality and the, the sort of community that builds up. That's one thing I really value. I don't know, Alex, how you feel about it, but like I've met so many people through my publications, like people just feel that they can write and I really welcome that. I know a lot of other people do too, but something about like a self-publication makes you seem like you're more approachable maybe than Stephen King or something. Um, yeah, I, I personally think you seem much more approachable than Stephen King. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Alex, do you want to respond? Yeah. Um, so why books? I think, like, um, let me see. Like a few years ago, I went to the Huntington Library and saw like some of the earliest, most ancient books that are, exist. And they don't look that much different from the books we make now. Um, essentially, they're like built the same way. So it's like this ancient technology, but I still think it's the most effective way um, to sort of package information, however that looks like. Um, so that's sort of like the fundamental why books, but also there's, um, you know, it's distributable. Um, they can recirculate, so they might go from you to one other person, but then they end up who knows where um, in libraries, you know, to friends. I just, when I was getting ready for this uh, talk, I, I found one of my books on eBay, <laughs> which is very strange to me, but, um, and yeah, that community that develops around um, artist publishing, self-publishing, zine making, um, it's a very like accessible, welcoming community. Um, and lastly, I'll say sort of just like the tangibility of, of a book, like this, the, the objectness of it, I think was really important, especially, especially in context of making work about the 70s, making work about 70s publishing culture as well. Um, and sort of just like re-entering that legacy felt in, important for, for this work, so. So one thing that um, really stands out to me, you know, there are these similarities in your work, obviously the, the 70s, looking at this similar source material. But one of the things that, that strikes me as a place where they diverge is this kind of urban rural separation. Um, you know, Alex, the people that you were communicating with, the publications that you were looking at were really about um, escaping the urban context for some idea of a, a you know, a, a utopian pastoral possibility. Um, and Tim, you know, your project is really rooted in the urban context, Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, and the utopian possibilities um, that there are within that. And I think in the larger public, um, maybe imagination about 
about utopian experiments, it's that rural escape that tends to loom largest. And maybe people don't imagine as much these kind of urban um, potentials. So, you know, I was wondering, and maybe this is more of something that you two could go back and forth about, but, um, you know, what are your thoughts about either the escape element or the kind of urban rooting element, um, maybe even in the context of today where we're experiencing something, experiencing something really similar, you know, a lot of social and political upheaval, um, a lot of rural flight by mainly white people of means who are escaping cities. Um, while at the same time, potential possibly opening up in the urban context as um, coronavirus drives housing costs down in urban setting, in urban settings. Um, so yeah, maybe you could just um, each maybe talk a little bit about the urban rural split, things that you, um, you know, how that personally might be of interest to you or what you uncovered through your research in this project about, about those, um, that dichotomy. Um, I'll Either one. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, like where I'm coming from, so I live in Somerville and my interest in this stuff is the utility of it. Um, how it, the ideas can be learned from, like so that a lot of these organizations fizzled out. So, you know, you can look at that as either, well, that idea fizzled out, or you can think of it as, hey, that was a really good idea. Why did it fizzle out? How can we not? How can we try it again and not have it fizzle out? Um, so uh, I started doing this stuff in 2017 after Trump got elected. And I was really looking for some way to change, uh, to inspiration um, for ways to change. And I thought other people would find it inspiring as well. And so that's where I'm coming from. Um, and yeah, a lot of these groups were about addressing specific social challenges. Um, I don't think it's really like diametrically opposed to what the Back to the Landers were doing. Um, you know, this idea that folks were sticking around in the cities and trying to change things. I think that they were trying to um, create new ways of living as part of their projects. And it just happened to be that they were staying in the cities. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, Alex, do you feel like your stuff is like diametrically opposed to the urban stuff? I mean, they kind of like was, people were moving back and forth a lot. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, I think Mother Earth News was sort of, um, it was sort of like serving its audience this like certain kind of like possible life in the country of like self-reliance and you know, traditional skills and all these things you can do. Um, so I think that's like one small like window. Um, but I, I think like the movement in general touched like all parts of America. Um, like there were lots of urban communes um, that were just like in big houses or like big apartments um, um, in the city. So I think that spirit of like social experimentation um, and cooperation was happening in, in, in both camps. Um, but I think this like movement from urban to rural, it's happened many times, you know, in the course of American history. This was just sort of the most recent and significant one. Um, but generally it's to escape sort of like the boom and bust of capitalism is why people like leave the city. Like that's the general like patterning. Like it follows like some recession or something. Um, I don't think it's ever happened post pandemic. Like I don't think in um, the 1918, was it flu? I don't think that, that this sort of like fleeing to the rural happened then um, the way it is now, um, which is pretty fascinating. And I'm really interested to see like demographically how the country is going to be changing um, in the next few years. But um, yeah, and I just wanna to say too, I think this idea of escape in the rural, I think it's always been tied to this sort of like 
fantasy and utopia and like agrarianism um, and sort of like world building. It's, it's obviously not a blank slate, but it's more of a blank slate than if you were going to like move into an apartment building, you know, your structures are already there, your city block is already there. Whereas if you're in the country, you can kind of like create your own kind of fantasy, whatever that looks like. So. Yeah, I think one of the things um, that always strikes me about the back to the land movement is that that it was about community, about creating a new community, but it was also about, it was like a rejection of, of a certain community in order to create a new community. And, um, you know, as I've thought about my own communal fantasies or utopian fantasies, I think I've also struggled with this question of, um, do you stay, if we're, if we're thinking of urban rural, like do you stay in the city and try to try to change the thing that you're in, or do you um, escape it or go somewhere else and try to build it anew? And I mean, I don't I don't think there's necessarily a, a a better or right or wrong answer. And I think maybe we need experiments on all at all points on the spectrum, maybe between those two. Um, but I definitely was thinking about that question as I was looking at your two projects and. Um, reading about different people's experiences, um, or even like the skill share. Thinking, Tim, you talked about how um, the groups, the urban groups, they often couldn't afford to have their own space, so they would share resources. And, you know, that made me think about in the sort of remote rural context, um, the sharing of resources was still there, but at at the level of the commune itself um, or the immediate neighbors. And yeah, so I, I think that's always an, of interest to me. Like how do we understand utopia within versus how do we um, think about it from without or, or without. Um, you know, I also wanted to talk to you about the correspondence part of it. Um, Tim, I think you, you mentioned this a little bit when you talked about the tours, um, but I was curious about how much interaction, if any, you had with the people from the organizations that you were researching as you were preparing the books. Um, and Alex, I was more wondering with your project, because it did seem to cut, like the responses just covered such, such emotional grounds, such upheaval. Um, if there were things about about your project that through that communication you were surprised to learn, um, yes, M maybe you could each just talk about like what relationship, how correspondence and exchange with this elder group um, impacted you, impacted the project, um, or your thinking more broadly, or your practice more broadly. I went first the first two times. Okay, I'll go. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, sure. sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like I said in the, the slides, that first few sets of letters I sent out and got responses back from were all surprises. Um, yeah, I just was, you know, a frazzled grad student and I had sort of inserted myself in someone else's life in a way and asked a, a big question. Um, and I don't know what I was, ex I don't think I was expecting to get anything back. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was the first surprise was like getting and kind of response and um, that caused me to sort of like step back and like be like, okay, I can't do this now, I have to do it when I can like give it my time and like respect and attention. Um, so that's what I, that's what I, what I did and just like pursued it with more intentionality. Um, and overall it was, I don't know how else to say it, but an extremely positive and like uplifting um, project. Like even people that I had written 
to the wrong address would write me back like wow this is so cool like good luck to you <laughs> like just to just to write me back and um yeah and I think like they were putting ads in those magazines because they were a certain kind of person and they were like dreamers or I idealists and um so to like hear from someone in the next generation kind of reflecting that back again um I think it was like a meaningful experience for both of us and um yeah and I just met some really amazing people and um yeah, another reason I was excited to publish it as a book to sort of like pass that on to, to, to other people as well, so. Thanks. Um, yeah, for me, um, I had the exact opposite experience. So I didn't reach out to anybody. Um, people, so I, I put out the first one, the Cambridge one, and then suddenly a bunch of people got in touch with me. And it just, I, you know, this is, I don't know how clueless I am. Like, I didn't even think to get in touch with these people. You know, I was doing this as like, hey, this is this fascinating thing I just found out about. I'm gonna like share it with everybody. Um, and I was really amazed by how many folks are still in the area and still really active. Um, so for instance, um, I found out that uh, some folks even just down the street in Union Square are still really active in um, their community. And some of them are leaders in the uh, equivalent radical movements of today. And it was, it was really fascinating, as, I don't know, um, sort of from a sociological perspective, I guess, like how uh, the knowledge is passed on, um, how it's kept up, how some people just remain active. Um, but yeah, so for the subsequent books, I got in touch with people. Um, I learned my lesson, but definitely for the walking tours. And I thought that um, the walking tours as a format with uh, people involved in the original organizations um, was really valuable for other folks. Um, just so, like I was saying, you know, when you have a walking tour, you know, you're, you know, most of the time you're walking, <laughs> right? So only sometimes you're actually there. In, uh, at the spots. And so there's all this time to mingle and talk to people. And so uh, to provide that space for folks to share ideas and, you know, establish new network connections, um, I thought was kind of a cool aspect of it. So I want to start bringing in some questions from the audience. Um, if you're in the audience, feel free to keep sending things in using that Q&A button. So Kim Sweetman, asks for both of you, what was the biggest insight you had or the most interesting story you found or the most unusual group you learned about through your research? Biggest insight, most interesting story or most unusual group? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I found so many fascinating things. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was how interrelated all the groups were. Um, so I, when I first was looking at the, the directories, I thought that the directories themselves were the sort of spider's web, whatever. Uh, but a lot of the people were involved in multiple groups uh, at different times. They shared spaces, they shared, um, or maybe they didn't share the physical address of their, of their public space, but maybe they like lived together. And it was kind of interesting to see like how cohesive it was. And a lot of the organi public facing organizations themselves were focused on like one issue, but as a whole, it was proposing this whole alternative culture that had its own infrastructure. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Alex, how about you? Um, I'm having trouble like choosing something. Um, most interesting story. Uh, the first like two that are coming to mind was um, one was a fellow who was sort of like an itinerant goat herder in the Southwest. And 
he basically like lived with his wife um just relying on goats and foraging um goat milk uh, in the arizona desert and was eventually like almost arrested by the sheriff for like trespassing on rancher's land and his wife was going to give birth like out in the desert and then um her parents like flew from Hawaii to find them and like pulled them out of there and <laughs> flew her home to have the baby and everything was fine but um uh yeah that was one of the one of the interesting stories um the other one I thought of was uh one story of a woman who her ad was from Country Women um and she went to Alaska to live on her own and was looking for other women to connect with there. And she ended up joining this group of women um, called the Klondikes. It was like a group of lesbians that lived uh, in the Alaskan bush and they built their own cabin. And um, anyway, she's had lots of adventures, but um, yeah, just really like fascinating life paths. And I would say like the biggest insight is just life, life paths are not linear <laughs> just hearing from people that are in their you know 60s to 80s now um sort of like starting their search in life and where it's taking them is just can be all over the place but you're still kind of maintaining that spirit of curiosity so and similarly so Kristen asks are there any examples of contemporary or current utopian societies in the US that are similar to those that began in the 70s. So um, maybe each of you could respond to that, like um, in relation to, to ones that you might be involved in, or like, I know Alex, you mentioned Salmon Creek. Um, Tim, I know you're really involved in, in a lot of community projects in um, Somerville, Cambridge and Boston. So maybe you could each talk about uh, something some contemporary version of a utopian society um, or a utopian project that you've interacted with. Sure, um, <laughs> Tim, go ahead. I think that, um, you know, the biggest one right now are the mutual aid networks. Um, so the, you know, the public facing do-goodery of the mutual aid networks is getting groceries to people who can't get groceries, uh, sharing cash. But what really makes them magical and what isn't always like foregrounded is that it's about changing the way people interact and the way people approach capitalism and money and sharing of resources. And I think it's really a magical response to um, the crisis, you know, like, so the 70s uh, where, you know, there was major, major social upheaval and people needed to change things and they needed to survive in different ways. They needed to look at different ways to interact because it wasn't working what was going on then. And the same way today, um, you know, once March hit, um, a lot of the social infrastructure just went out the window and a lot of people were just left behind. And so folks in mutual aid networks like banded together. And I think it's really beautiful. I think it's, um, I think it's a really magical thing. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna return to this idea. Um, Alex, I wanna give you a chance to respond to this and then maybe we can pick up on this contemporary moment um, and the relevance of, of some of the ideas from in the, from the seventies to the moment now. Yeah, I'll, I'll just respond quickly I, for about contemporary utopian communities. Um, so there are a lot of communes that lasted from their you know, start in the seventies and are still going strong. Um, one is in Virginia, Twin Oaks. Um, there's a bunch in the Ozarks. Um, Tim, what is that, the organization that took over Communities Magazine? It's kind of like- Yeah, a um, it's IC, the in 
intentional communities, maybe IC stands for, but yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's still, it's still like a thriving social structure. Um, and yeah, so Salmon Creek Farm was a, a former commune in the 70s that lasted, I think, um, gosh, maybe like 20 years into the 80s. Um, and it was purchased by the artist Pratig and he's sort of re revitalizing it and remaking it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's another interesting like then and now project to this time. Um, so yeah, and I, I've been like, you know, involved there for a few years, just going back and forth and working on stuff, but um, it's not really a commune. It, I think it doesn't really have a permanent community, so, uh, except for Fritz, so. And so stop. people go there and they like can stay? Do they have to book it or? Um, yeah, it's sort of like a network of friends, more like, I guess you could describe it that way. Yeah, and I think that um, there are different strategies he's used. I, I think that they've, and maybe this year was different too with, um, with the pandemic and not being able to have such a uh, revolving door of people coming and going and working there. But um, I think that he's tried out a number of different strategies. People could apply to work there. Students could do more of like a work placement artists could pitch a project that they wanted to do that contributed to the land and the community in some way. Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, and it's, he's only been its steward for a couple of years, but the amount of um, work that he and this community have done, it, it's really fascinating to look. So um, people should definitely check it out. It's called Salmon Creek. Um, but I want to return, yeah, to this to this moment. You know, there's. It's of course whatever I say will only be an understatement um, that this is a time of intense political and social upheaval. That you know the pandemic first destabilized the economy, the public, our communities, but then the you know the reckoning with racial capitalism, carceral capitalism, um, and white supremacy that this country and the world has been sort of grinding through um, over the last you know, six or seven months, um, at least this intensely for the, for the last six or seven months, it has been really incredible seeing the ways that communities are finding ways to go around the system to fill in holes um, left by a system that doesn't serve the majority of people, um, especially not people of color. Um, and, you know, I, I've been thinking or throughout tonight's program and thinking about this idea that goes back to um, Proudhon and Marx and that the black socialists have been talking a lot about this year, which is the idea of dual power. Um, that you're not going to just create a new world, you know, like this, but that you actually have to be creating that world at the same time. So you're, you're operating within the world of capitalism at the same time that you're working sort of underneath it to create a, a world of, of community and democracy that, that as that builds and grows can eventually you know, push out or get rid of capitalism, but that that the dual is that that you need both of those things, or maybe you don't need them, but they're both part of the process if we will ever get rid of capitalism. Um, and so, you know, maybe as we're coming, you know, we're in our last 10 minutes or so, um, thinking about the urgencies of the present moment and the research that you've done about this previous moment that has so many similarities to now. Um, maybe you could each talk a little bit about, you know, what you see as, as the, the utility of understanding what happened um, to the 60s, in the 60s and 70s. And what can we learn from that? Or what have you learned from it that you might be applying to your own life, applying to your practice, um, 
that you might be bringing your, to your community or that other fight folks might bring to their communities. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll leave the question sort of there um, and see what, what you think about it. It's a big it's a big question. And I think, you know, since March, we've all been sort of living it, like living the question, trying to trying to figure out what we can do for ourselves and for each other in a time when we can't really gather in the way we used to gather. Um, and I, I think what Tim was saying about the mutual the mutual aid groups that are coming together. Um, right now is the thing I'm seeing that's really inspiring. Just like um, in my neighborhood alone, there's two free fridges that are just, they're always filled with fresh food. And even my neighbors, like they'll just put a cardboard box out with like oranges and canned food every day. You know, it's like these small gestures um, and then there's like larger networks of um, uh, sort of like resource, resource sharing, um, creating networks, um, even like skill sharing. Like now we have the internet, like back then they didn't have the internet, you know, they just had these, these magazines and pamphlets that you would like send five bucks in to get in the mail later. Um, um, yeah, so I mean, I'll start there as like a, a start to that answer. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, it's really beautiful, all of these like individual gestures that people are doing and like the, the more community-based ones. Um, I think that the 70s really, and you know, this is my bias, but I think that the urban stuff has a whole wealth of um, inspiration for today. So as we're facing, you know, this impending recession, uh, you know, more and more businesses are closing left and right every day. Um, these people in the 70s were trying to make do with reduced funds and ways that they can help each other out and cooperatives and collectives uh, where you didn't necessarily have to pay. You could just, you know, do in kind where like, you know, I need my sink fixed and whatever, you know, like I, I'm willing to do this in exchange. And so all these ways of approaching things where the bottom line isn't the bottom line, right? Like we're, we're taught to believe that you should only do things if you're gonna get paid for them. Um, but there, you know, that's just a bias that we've been taught. And I think that the, in the 70s, there was this whole mass exploration of other ways of getting stuff done. And the, um, I was talking about the, the collective businesses, like some of them were actually anti-profit. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea was they knew they were gonna lose money. Like if, if they insisted on making money, then they would have to compromise their values. They might last for five years, but they would compromise their values, but they knew they were gonna lose anyway. So why not just, who cares about the bottom line? We'll only be open for a year, but we'll do some really good stuff. And so there was this exploit, this idea that you didn't really have to do that. Uh, I know that in Spain during, um, during like 2010, 2012, um, there was a huge recession in like Barcelona and a lot of people were doing um, time banks and like alternative currencies and stuff like that. And that stuff sort of has its root or there was an expression of that in the seventies that I think uh, folks could really look at that might be useful now. Yeah, I think this the idea, similarly, this idea of um, degrowth or non-growth that it you know, capitalism is so obsessed with growth. Things can't just subsist or sustain. Um, it's always about the pursuit of more. And, you know, it's been inspiring in the last, you know, it, during this time, the last year to hear from folks who are talking, who are resisting that. And, you know, maybe they have a, um, a business that they're trying to run and maintain, but it's actively not about getting bigger, getting more. It's just, it's just about doing the thing at the level. And, and I really appreciate that resistance to the capitalist machine that just says it has to be more, it has to be bigger. Um, 
you know, let's the sharing machine, the sharing economy. Actually, it sounds gross to say the sharing economy. Actually, <laughs> just let's just call it sharing. Um, offers so much more humanity that that is just completely drained out of capitalism. Um, but seeing these glimpses of it, participating in them, um, is is I personally find it so nourishing and inspiring because um, it's really hard to it's hard to be nourished and to carve out that space in a capitalist society that is is not actually trying to trying to do that for the majority of the people who are inhabiting it. Um, I don't know if that, that's kind of a dark, that wasn't a question. <laughs> that, was just, that was just a rant. Um, so it's the last few minutes now I wanna, uh, you know, do you have any questions for each other or is there anything you wanna go back to or talk about um, or maybe even like give us a glimpse into of projects that you're working on now going forward that might be related to this work or not? I have one I thing. Alex, so, two minutes. What are, so, so what are you doing? <laughs> I just want to say one one thing before we move on um, that just my like flag went up about it and then someone commented, asked a question about coming arts living off welfare back then. Um, I think it's important to like be aware of the, the privilege involved in being able to experiment so wildly and experiment and like fail on like such a huge level. Like what kind of people can like start a business that's not meant to make money and then be okay after that business fails, you know? Um, so I think that's one thing I've been thinking a lot about like hindsight with the seventies, like what have we actually learned from that time? Um, it's just, that's one of the things is like recognizing that privilege, whether it's like class or race. Um, it's like, where does that fit into that time period of like utopian thinking and um, like failure, like the, a lot of the comments were huge, you know, disasters in the end, at least the ones that are famous. Um, so it's something to just like keep in, keep into the conversation as well, I think, as we're looking back on this and um, yeah. Yeah, that's an important point. And I, since the audience can't see this, I, I want to just say it more clearly. So um, Abby Satinsky put in, she sent a, a note in that said, it's also my understanding from anecdotal reading that a lot of people in communes were living off of welfare. And that's not something that as many people have access to now. Um, and I think, it, you know, it's interesting that, that that, that it was happening at both ends of that spectrum too. There were there were communes that were able to get by off of the money, the small amounts of money that they got through welfare from the government. But as Alex, you're saying, there was also a huge amount of privilege. Um, a lot of people who participated in the back to the land movement um, or were able to buy the land and have the, the cash flow for the structures. Um, there was often a person with money or people with independent wealth that would allow them to um, be able to sort of leave society behind and, and do their own thing. And um, who had the means to do that and how did they, they have those means is definitely something to keep um, in mind as we reflect on this time. Okay, oh, Catherine's going, <laughs> hi Catherine. Oh, you're muted. Use the lull. <laughs> but um, I, I didn't want to step on the toes of answering that question about what projects you have in the works now. I, I So if you had answers to that, I don't mean to interrupt. I can cede the floor to that before. Closing. Yeah, Catherine, if, if we could give each of them just a couple of minutes and maybe during that time, you could put some links in the chat um, so that the audience can find ways that they could get copies of their books or to learn more about the exhibition. And then we can let Alex and Tim just, if they wanna say anything about upcoming projects or shows, we'd love to hear. Um, yeah, I'll just real quick, I, I've been working on, um, right before the pandemic happened, I um, did a project on 
this wild cabbage that grows in the Marin, Headland, Marin Headlands um, right off the coast here uh, near my studio. Um, and I've been researching its origins and um, sort of implications and uh, contemporary life. So it's a bit esoteric and different from this work, but um, that's sort of what I'm wrapping my head around now. Thanks. Tim? Um, yeah, so I, I also make posters. So I'm working on some posters, but I have a new um, zine series that I started um, that I launched in May uh, that looks at, um, it's called Magical Spaces. It's about um, underground cultural and art spaces, uh, how they function and, um, you know, to send, kind of serve as a guide and also a memorial to some of the past ones. Um, and so hopefully there will be one or two of those coming out this year, next year, something like that. Cool. Well, thank you both so much for being in the show. There are also a couple of other artists from the show who are at tonight's event. So thanks to them for coming. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me uh, and for our audience about your work. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing the projects that you have coming up in the future. And I want to echo um, on behalf of Fruitlands, a thank you um, to Alex and Tim for this evening. And also thank you so much, Paige, for uh, facilitating this wonderful conversation and um, and working with, with Shana on this incredible show. Um, so uh, as Paige mentioned, I have put some links in the chat box uh, for your reference um, to Alex's work and Tim's work, um, as well as links about Fruitlands and visitation. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the program, we are open on weekends and uh, the Recruiting for Utopia exhibition is up through March 21st. So if you are in the Massachusetts, Boston, greater Boston area um, and would like to come out and see it, we would love to have you. Um, and just noting that we are doing advanced ticketing um, to have capacity controls during these pandemic times. Um, so that link is there as well. Um, but I think unless anyone has final parting words, um, I think we will leave it there. Um, so again, a thank you to our panel and a thank you to our audience. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye, good night.